Welcome to the High Quality Fun Podcast, where tough times make good stories. In today's episode, we sit down with Nathan, who helps run the Little Red Barn, which is a mobile petting farm owned and operated by his grandmother. We talk about the farm's origin story and how it has evolved into a cherished community endeavor. Nathan shares first-hand insight into the daily routines and responsibilities involved in farm life and get into some more challenging aspects such as births, raising newborns, and the heartbreaking struggles of protecting their animals from wild predators. Despite these obstacles, Nathan's commitment to the well-being of the animals, his family, and the business shine through in this conversation. Later in the episode, we dive into the construction of a new house on the property, highlighting the valuable lessons learned through this process and the anticipation of future endeavors. Join us as we explore the highs and the lows of farm life, discovering and enduring spirit and determination required to overcome obstacles and achieve long-term goals. So grab a seat and get ready for this episode of the High Quality Fun Podcast. Yes, sir. Well, thanks for having me on, first of all. Um, I'm Farmer Nathan, and I've been helping out with the Little Red Barn. We've been, we are a mobile petting farm. We bring out cows, donkeys, horses, sheep, goat, rabbit, roosters. And I know my mom, if she ever watches, she's going to correct me, sheep, not sheeps. Um, so we bring, we bring seven animals total and we go out and we do birthday parties, go to churches. And I've been, I came up here to help out and that's been a big part of my life. So I'd say that's a, that, that, that's a good introduction for me. <laughs> and you've been doing this for how long now? I've been doing this for about two years now. Um, but my, my grandmother had started the little red barn about two years ago, two years before that. Do you have like a, do you have like an introduction story to how this happened? I don't know how long you guys have been living, uh, or your grandmother has been living at that farm location, but is there an introduction story about how this whole thing started? Now I don't take my complete word for it. But as far as I know, my grandmother, she was one day uh, a, a single mother in her in her home, and she's taking care of three kids, and she's got a lot going on. And she said she just got um, a vision from from God, or it felt like she was been spoken to to go out and go buy some animals and take them, start doing birthday parties. So I, as far as I know, that's the how it kind of got the ball rolling she just had the idea and was going with it and it just kept evolving and evolving to what it is today and it it's gone through a lot and you know to see it where it is today has been been fantastic you know, it's been, it's been yeah i didn't realize that it was only what you've been there two years she's been doing it for two years since then so i didn't realize this was only like four years old uh that's that's interesting well, sorry I messed that up there. I messed that up. She she had started a little over 30 years ago, not two years ago. Oh, okay. That but sounds I, more, more accurate. That up. She, um, yeah, a little over 30 years ago, she had started it. I, I grew up around all the animals and, you know, it was, it, it wasn't just, I think it started two years ago. I don't know how I, how I started with that. Sorry. The podcast jitters. All good. You're right. um, that makes, that makes way more sense. Okay. We'll just pretend I misheard you. Yep. Um, no, that's awesome. I I'm really excited to dive into just the farm life with you and like some of the chores and rough things you got to do and and everything. So why don't why don't we just start it off with like a day to day? Because you you left high school, you kind of joined this family business, and you know you're working a completely different job than everybody else who leaves high school or goes off to college. Well. No, I'm so sorry. Now you're just looking like a, just a day to day, just yeah, how just a day to day. Usually a, a day to day, um, m much different than obviously, you know, whenever I was in high school, I just woke up, went to school and really didn't have a lot of responsibility. But then up here, you know, whenever I wake up, I got to start taking care of animals. We have all of our cows, donkeys, horses, sheep, goat, rabbit and roosters, and they need to be fed and watered every day. They, they need to be taken care of. So Every single day I wake up and I start up top at the little barn and we take care of uh, our little cows. We keep our calves up there. And then we have, if we ever have um, 
baby animals born, like baby cows, baby donkeys, or baby goats, or baby sheep even, we put them up top. So right now we do have some baby goats up there. So the day-to-day has been, we go out there and feed grain or hay grain and water them. Um, And then after they're all done, they're good for the day, usually until around evening time. And then we make our way over to the cows. We'll go to the cows. We give them grain, make sure they have water and hay as well. And, you know, just kind of mess around with them. Um, just get to know them in the morning. Just hang out. Just have a good time. And then usually we'll move into, we have uh, some chickens up there. Uh, we had some chickens that weren't doing the greatest. And you just want to keep an eye on them. So we have them up there up, uh, up top as well and taking care of them. And then after that, we start moving down to the barn where we have our rabbits and our most of our chickens we have down there. And we grain, water, just take care of all of them. And that usually takes down at the barn about 30 minutes. Up top is about 30 minutes. So it's, it, it's about an hour, hour and a half, uh, sometimes two hours in the morning to just knock out all the chores and we do have some cows as well and some equine animals, um, even some some goats and sheep. It's it, it kind of is all over the place sometimes, but it it all has a kind of a science to it. You just got to get to all of them every day and make sure they're fed and watered. And I know that so you're kind of jumping into this to help take care of a lot of the animals. And I know that your. Your grandmother when we were visiting at least she was on the phone nonstop, kind of taking calls making schedules handling all the paperwork with everything uh and you you had a buddy that was also helping you out and then like i don't know i know you have all these these oddball chores you have to do from time to time that's a part of farm life um when well i'll say this real quick yeah you you mentioned that you have the little barn up top and yeah that's like right out their front door and then down the hill is the big barn where the rest of the animals are. But we have our two daughters and you totally made Cora's day. She would not shut up about it on the rest of the drive. But uh, in between feeding all the animals, Nathan was kind enough to bring their their like show pony out. And Cora got to ride this pony up and down the driveway several times, just smiling from ear to ear. Uh, so that was cool. And then you guys had the baby goats, which which was great. Like we could walk out the front door and the 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 kids could just go and play and feed with the little animals there and interact with the cows so that was super fun kind of the first time they really got to experience a barn uh and farm animals except for like the fair um this is their first time getting like up close and personal with them and yeah we didn't have to pay like 20 bucks to let them ride a few laps on a a fair pony oh yeah they they'll 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 run up those pockets there (laughs) but that, that was uh i believe that was pepper the pony and pepper is fantastic you know and it was great having y'all up there being able to have them up there to have was it their first pony ride or it sounds like they oh, might yeah. have, that was their first oh yeah so that's awesome that's awesome yeah i mean these animals we bring them up and all of our all my little cousins come up and we'll get pony rides and get to come up and see the goats and i, I love making their days they they definitely have blast and I, I hope they always remember it you know I remember those pony rides. They're gonna gonna keep having them back up and having more. <laughs> oh, we drive through enough that we'll we'll be seeing them. You'll get to see them grow up a little bit. That's um, good. I think that's a, a decent transition into your weekends. Like your your grandma's taking calls, booking all these these party events on weekends. It's got to be your busiest time. Um, how far are you traveling in to get to these events and? Like, what type of parties are you hosting for? So, typically what we do is we do birthday parties. Um, That's been our main, uh, usually source, uh, main jobs on the weekends. But we typically also do schools. Uh, They'll have, like, Halloween events or Christmas events or maybe, like, a fun run or something. And they'll have the animals out or sometimes even churches. We have a lot of churches, you know, especially on Sundays. Sunday service will occasionally walk a donkey down and go out. Um, But usually um, these jobs, they're about an hour to an hour and a half away from where we're located. Now, most of our jobs are in the inner city where typically people don't see a lot of animals. So being able to have animals to bring the animals to people there, uh, people, it it really is a treat for them. 
So, so it is a little bit farther for us, but sometimes it depends. We can get lucky and sometimes there's, you know, a few events in the area and we do have some that are a little closer, but most of the time we're traveling about an hour, I would say. And, uh, yeah. Is there anything worth noting with that, you know, pack up and tear down and set up process? I don't know if there's anything that really sticks, but it is, it is a lot of labor. Well, I, know, I know that when, uh, when we were visiting, you had a photographer come in and it was interesting watching you guys sprint around the property, loading them up into this trailer, which I assume it's the same trailer you used to, to haul them down the highway. But yeah, yeah, like trying to mush these giant animals and get them to go in the direction you wanted was a little bit comical. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's always, they just move around wherever they want to go. They just have a blast, but you know, they, they learn, we put them in uh, whenever they're just born with their mothers and they just get used to everything. We want to make sure the animals are very comfortable out there at the job. So we just get them very desensitized to it where they can load right up in a trailer. Like, you know, you saw, we're just trying to run them around, throw them in the trailer and bring them down to the photo shoot. And it's, it's always hectic, but they, they, we've kind of trained them to get used to all the, the craziness and it's all that they know. So just trained right into it. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they were all great with the girls. I never once was afraid that they were going to get trampled or anything. Um, I want to, I want to dive into some of the, maybe the not so fun parts of the farm life. Um, when we were leaving, you guys were actually dehorning some of the new like the the younger cows and i mean unfortunately we had to boogie out because we were heading up to indianapolis to go see some friends and just had a long drive ahead of us but yeah between the 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 new babies and the maintenance the the horns like there's a lot of dirty chores that you have to do while you're on the farm um why don't you kind of explain the process of dehorning and why you even do that. And then we can go into some other stuff. Well, now typically there is a few reasons why people dehorn, but for us particularly, the reason we dehorn them is because we take them out to events and our, our well, let's say this too. Like these are the female cows, right? Fem- I yep. always forget that female cows are born with horns until I'm reading a children's book and see it. And uh, cause you never see cows with like female cows with horns. You just see the, the big it's balls not the horns. You know, it's usually not the most common. A lot of people don't know that, but they there is like you can even have bulls that don't have horns. It's it's just a genetic thing. It's if they're pulled, oh, wow. call it. So yeah, but we do have a few that don't have horns, but most of them do. So we do have to take care of them. Just whenever we take them out to jobs and they're just hanging out with people, occasionally you know their neck starts to scratch. Maybe they're not getting a scratch there, and they try to rub it you know and just get up on people's legs or you know if there's a little kid around though it could be a problem if you know they you know try to swing around or maybe if they're just have an itch on their back and they're just trying to get to it they might turn really fast and hit a kid and knock them over and that can be really bad for not only the kid but it can be bad for you know older people as well you know a cow's horn can get you in a spot and it could not be so good so just for our safety and other people's safety we do dehorn them now it's not it's not really painful for them i i wouldn't they do bleed but how i I guess i should explain how exactly we do it we have um a tool now i i should know a lot more about this i don't know the the tool but it's got like two it's it's got big hand it's like loppers it's like a shear it's like a shear with uh it's like an ice cream scoop shear Yep. Yep. And kind of just, you know, you got to pry on it. You got to get it kind of deep down there on the the thick of the horn. Um, And once you get it, get it in there, then you just tear it off. And we, I I, know I've personally watched it one time happen before to two cows that we did. And I watched it. And at first, the first time you see it, you're like, oh my goodness. Like my buddy Kenneth, that was there. um, The the second time we did it, whenever y'all were there, he he told me that he almost passed out a little bit. Like he had to turn that out of the way and look. And I, I completely get it. If you're not used to seeing blood flying a little bit, you're probably not going to be 
you know, you're not going to be all great with this, but basically what, what you do is you get it over the, the thick of the horn and then you, um, you cut it off. And then once it's off, then the, the real work starts. And then you got to find the little tendon or no, not tendon. Uh, I'm sorry. The blood vessel or uh, again, I, I shouldn't really know. It this. reminds me of like a, like getting your wisdom teeth removed. Like you, I think that there's stuff that they have to do to the root canal to make it stop. So it's probably the canal of that bone. Uh, and I'm just speculating. I don't actually know. Well, I, it's, it's something that the blood passes through. So I don't, Maybe it's like a blood vessel or something. I don't know, but we have to use. Um, they look like scissors. They're like. Um, I really need to study up on these terms. Um, don't worry about it. You like use scissors. Uh, like hospital type scissors, where you have to grab the. Um, I'm gonna call it the. Uh, the Vein. blood. I guess you grab it and you have to pull it out, and you have to cut it down super super shallow. So whenever it gets sucked back up in there, the blood doesn't come gushing to the top because they can bleed out from this and it can be bad if it's not taken care of properly. But once that is pulled out and it sucked back in there, the bleeding stops. And then we put in a cotton ball and we put in some ointment on top just to make sure no flies get on it, make sure it heals back up and then it's good to go. But there, you know, there can be differences in cows. Like one time we were cutting a horn and usually the inside of the horns are shallow. They're, they're not all the way um, solid through like a regular bone is. So it, it, can be, it makes it pretty easy that it's, you know, not solid. But we did run into one cow, solid horn. Mm. You know, my, my grandfather, uh, my grandma, you know, they, they couldn't, they've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> I mean, just craziness. And, I mean, he was prying and prying and prying with everything he's got. And he just, he could not do it. We had to get the saws off and we had to oh. saw that thing. I mean, just in th the animal was fine. They, they can't feel their horns per se. It's, I, it wasn't mooing. It wasn't freaking out, but that was definitely one of the crazier ones. And we still have the horns. I want to keep the horns and just keep them as souvenirs. To just, I mean, I just think they look pretty cool. Um, but it, it is, it is a very fascinating process on, on how the whole thing works and definitely watching it the first time. I mean, it's not for the faint hearted. Whenever <laughs> you, uh, you initially cut it, that blood vessel is just squirting blood out. I mean, just squirting. I got it all over my jacket. It's all over my pants. I'm covered in blood and I had to hold them so they wouldn't, um, move. Uh, they, they wouldn't move too much, but we, we do have them in a head gate. I should, should have probably also started with that. So we, we put their head through and then it kind of just closes in on their head and holds it in a tight spot. So that way we don't have to chase them around and all that crazy stuff. But it's, um, it's real fun. It definitely is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I kind of wanted to see it. I was a little bit bummed out. I'm, I hunt. And so I've like gotten processed my own deer and everything. And it it's, it's a little eerie at first, but I feel like it's also kind of, I don't think humbling is the word. I'd say grounding, like to actually do all that and see, see the work that goes into, you know, raising these cattle or like harvesting a deer and what goes into making your food instead of just buying it from the grocery store. Um, it definitely puts, puts you in touch with, with how you're actually acquiring this meat, where it comes from. Um, and I know that, do you guys actually sell do you actually eat any of the animals when they're at the end of their, uh, I don't even call, know how to call it, at, what they're at the end of their time being showcased for the, the mobile petting farm? None of the animals we use, and I want to make sure people know this, none of the animals we use for our petting farm, um, we butcher and eat those animals. They live out the rest of their lives either on our farm or on another farm. Um, but, we do butcher some animals like we have butchered um, a cow recently, but it's just um, you butcher them typically whenever they're a little younger. Uh, you know, we, we waited till about a year and about a half and then we butchered that cow. But that cow never been messed with, terrified of us, wouldn't come near us. <laughs> Nobody ever associated like that cow was just there. And that that's the cow that we used to butcher. And 
you know, we also process that whole thing ourselves. And, you know, that process, you really have a lot of respect for that animal, you know, everything going into it. And, you know, to put that meat on your table, you have a lot more sense of like, you know, I well, you just feel a lot more uh, fulfilled. I don't know, kind of putting that meat on your table. It's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. But we, so we none, don't of the, none of the cute animals we share when we make this post get butchered they get uh they get auctioned off from my understanding to other other farms and other families yep yep we have we uh we'll send them off we have an auction up here in calhoun that we'll send them to but typically we sell them to private owners that are people that are just looking for a pet at their farm we try not to give it to anyone that's just butchering because we've had many people ask us out at jobs um you know, they people come up to me. Hey, is that goat for sale? I'm looking to butcher a goat, and I'm like, what? I'm like, first of all, they're miniature. Goats. Why would you? It's it's just craziness. First of all, wait until your little niece is done petting the goat before you talk to me. <laughs> like, let's take the step by step feel it. Oh my gosh. Well, um, well, that that's uh that's interesting. That's good to know. I, I assume you still like harvest the eggs and stuff like that for your for breakfast and whatnot. But aside mm-hmm. from eggs and the the non show cows, it sounds like all the animals really have one purpose, and that's to to get out to the the people for the petting farm. Yep. Um, now, when we were also there there were some real tiny baby goats. I assume that you've had a handful of births that you've had to be a part of there. Uh, oh, yeah. Is that true? I've been a part of a lot of baby goat births. <laughs> now, usually we don't, we don't watch them give birth, but typically what will happen is, is we come out there in the morning just doing chores on our routine and we'll just hear little, you know, baby goats bleating and we just get to go out there and, you know, pet on them and we'll bring them up and we, we always put them in their own spot to make sure, you know, they're the safest and mama can take care of them. But yeah, I mean, seeing, seeing them give birth has been a real treat. I think that's definitely one of the big payoffs up at the farm is watching, you know, life come to this world and seeing all that. It's definitely been, it's been, it's been a huge blessing. And I know uh, it, it has been a little hard with the goats but this year has been way better. We had um, a nasty, some type of virus that came through our farm, um, just just for our goats, because um, they're just in their own separate pasture, where a lot of them were coming out premature. So oh, a lot yeah. of my first introduction to these mm-hmm. uh, baby goats uh, were them I'm finding them, and maybe they'd be alive for a few hours, and then they just die. And it was. It was very awful at first, but now we've gotten to a point where we're seeing some good baby goats. They're healthy. We got them taken care of. So hopefully we don't see that anymore this year. Do you birth, do you guys, uh, like, do you always have a litter or for all the animals, do you have the babies on the farm or do you ever just like buy the cow, you know, already grown or, or anything? Well, it depends on what we're looking for. So typically what will happen is, is like for our goats, we'll keep our females and then we'll buy um, a new male every other year to get new a new uh, gene line in there. And we don't want to keep breeding the same animals over and over again. So we'll always switch out the male just about every other year. Um, so we've been doing that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I know another story. This is, this one's kind of sad. Uh, I know you guys have had some like issues with local wildlife. Oh yeah. These dogs, we had some dogs come in and they tore up our chickens. They tore up our bunnies, our goats, our sheep, and i guess i guess that was it there no and some guineas we had some guineas running around we've had a few different incidents but i guess the the first two that come to mind is we had one uh one night i just finished up with a job um it was on the weekend long weekend we get in and it's probably like 10 10 30 
and I left earlier that morning and I get down to the barn and there is a, I mean, chickens scattered everywhere. Cause first I got out of the truck and I grabbed my light to just look around, you know, it's nighttime. We typically have animals that come around, but it's no big deal, but I like to shine my light. You know, I, I have my gun with me. Sometimes if a raccoon comes out, we'll shoot it or something. But that, that particular night, whenever I shine that light, it was a much different scene. There was chickens everywhere, feathers everywhere, just a massacre. I mean, the uh, metal cages just ripped, the rebar ripped. I mean, I don't even understand how the dog had that much strength. But oh the, I, we assume that there, well, actually, sorry, we know there was two dogs that came in. Um, there was two, we, we saw where one of them got actually stuck. There was still a dog there. It trapped itself inside of a cage. So thank God that one was good. I, um, I had my girlfriend at the time sit on top of the cage to make sure I didn't go anywhere. I don't know how she, I mean, she was a trooper. She got on top of there. And then I went around and I was looking for the other dog because we did hear another dog whenever, uh, or we didn't hear a dog, but I kind of saw a dog whenever I glanced the light over and this the dog that was trapped though that was the only one couldn't find the other one and went over there you know i called my grandparents i'm like this is awful what are we going to do we had the police come out and um i took care of the dog i shot the dog it's on our property it killed our livestock legally we're allowed to kill that dog it um it did have a blue collar on but this dog uh didn't have a tag of any sort it was just a collar so we have no idea whose dog it was filed a police report if it ever happens again then maybe we can do something about it so it was just total loss i think we lost like 13 chickens oh my gosh and that that was just awful but then the second one where it gets worse is we had uh, a pack of about I, th- I believe it was just four dogs and this pack, little did we know, had been terrorizing other farmers in the area and going and messing. I think people had caught them on like their deer cams and stuff like that. And these dogs would come in and they, we had, two, we have two, our goats and our sheep in two separate pastures. And they went in both of those pastures and picked at every single one of the animals. I mean, I think we lost four goats and three or two sheep the first time um they came in and i mean they roughed everyone up though all of them were cut up we had to have the dock out doctor them all up we had to keep them up top hunting for these dogs i mean we were just hunting for these dogs it was just a wild pack just a wild pack of dogs people just let their dogs go or something happened and they get out and so we're like, all right, we're on edge. We keep our animals, our goats and our sheep up top. Just keep them a close eye on. But after, you know, a month or so goes out, we weren't able to catch them. Um, we put them back. And we're like, all right, we should be good. I haven't seen them come back. Should be should be set. Well, one morning we're all up and my nan calls me. She's like, hey, there's dogs down by the goats and the sheep. And immediately i grab my rifle but before i can even get out there michael is um or my grandfather grabbed his rifle and he's already down there with uh my grandma and he he took uh probably like four or five shots he he wounded one of them um and that one kind of made it through the fence and as far as we i mean it was bleeding bad so we assume it dropped dead somewhere and then the other one was so wounded that it couldn't even get through the fence. So I, I killed that one. That, that one was done. Another two just got away. And the, the other two they got away were a husky. Another one was like a pit bull of some sort. Um, and so that had happened. And they did a lot more damage that time. They really roughed up more goats, more. Sh- I mean, we are, we are down with animals. It is not a great scenario. So there's still two dogs on the go and we still have to figure out how are we going to get these dogs we traveled around we drove around the area to see because we live um our farm you drive past there is like a a, a kind of not a trailer park but a few trailer homes through on the way up here we thought maybe one of the dogs belonged to them we've had this issue before with them so we go around can't find anything we get another police report you know we do everything we can do and come to find out, we hear from the feed store in town that we go to that 
other people have had the same problem. It, it isn't just us. Other people have seen these dogs, but we took care of two of them. And as far as we know, there's two left. And we, at this point, we've lost so many goats, so many sheep. They even, whenever they came in, one of the times they killed two of our bunnies. I mean, great bunnies. Just, just killing stuff for sport. No reason at all. And so finally, to have a, a nice ending to this story, there was those last two dogs. One of them was a female. One of them was a male. And the female we found out was pregnant because we finally were able to trap it. We finally got it one morning. So happy. Uh, we got it. It was actually, we found out it was pregnant. And if it would have had those babies, they get hungry. And if they know where food is, they would have came back for our animals and it would not have been good. So we thankfully took care of that one. The other one never showed back up. And with our goats and sheep, we put uh, two donkeys out there with them. So now if a uh, animal comes or a coyote comes up or something, they'll get kicked by the donkey. We have horses kind of surrounding them. So as far as security goes, they should be good. We took care of the dogs, and there's a somewhat of a happy ending there. <laughs> oh, my God. I did I'm, not hear the, the long form of that. That's wild. Yeah. I was going to ask what you do for security, and it sounds like aside from traps, patrols, searching the area. like We are on deck with our rifles ready. I mean, even – just the other day, this happened, I think, like two days ago. There was a dog that we saw, no collar, walking on our road up to our farm. And if it steps on our property, we have calves that are being born. We have baby goats that are being born. We have helpless animals. And, you know, these are mini animals. They're not used to. And, like, we are there. We have to take care of them. So right. we have to make sure that nothing's going to happen to them. And dogs, dogs especially, got to look out for them. I mean, they're. They'll they'll come in and get like, come in and get these animals. That's that's nuts though. Like you mentioned that it was a you know a pit bull and a husky, and one had a collar. Like I, I'm imagining my dog's pretty good and pretty timid with with a lot of things, but I assume that if it ever got out in the wild and had to live on it its own, like its natural instincts would come back and it would probably do the same thing. You know, tear up an yeah. animal for sport. Well, that was the the first one that came in and got all the chickens. That was the one with the collar. The other four that came in, they didn't have any collar. They were all just wild dogs, which they could have been someone's pet that, like you said, maybe ran away. But, I mean, these were some mean dogs. They had they they were not loved by anyone. For <laughs> time. They were just demons. They were monsters. So we uh, we got them out the way. Man, that that is really unfortunate because you have so much time and energy into those those animals, and you know that it costs money and your livelihood to get those back. Yeah, and I mean you can't just get an animal like that back, and you know that 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 whole situation was a big um, learning point for me up at the farm. Was like whenever I first moved up here. I'm not used to seeing all these animals dying, you know, like I only ever saw the highlights of it, but somebody's going to have to do it. You know, somebody's yeah. going to take care of all the animals. Somebody's going to have to do all the dirty work. So, you know, got to, got to take care of some dogs and you got to take care of some dogs. That's nuts. That's nuts. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's uh, hopefully that doesn't make our listeners too queasy, but I, I think that's just the reality of it. It's, there's no, no way around it. Um, got to keep the little ponies alive if you want to see them on the weekend. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. Here on the High Quality Fun Podcast, we love showcasing people's stories through our interviews and posts. This gives our guests the opportunity to share their favorite memories, but sometimes audio alone is not enough. Most people are sitting on a collection of hundreds of photos and videos capturing their favorite moments without the time or experience needed to compile these memories into a video. This is why I have chosen to partner with Spivo. Simply send them your unsorted photos and videos, and in seven days or less, they will create a professional video edit that allows you to relive your favorite memories again and again. To ensure every customer is satisfied with their video edit, Spivo provides unlimited revisions for 30 days and offers a 100% money-back satisfaction guarantee. 
As someone who has limited time to edit his family adventures, let alone this podcast, I am excited to work with Spivo to help everyone eternalize their favorite moments. Visit spivo.com slash discount slash high quality fun to learn more and let us know what you think about the product. We'd love to share it. Now, back to the show. Uh, another thing that I wanted to go into, um, this is, as we stated, you know, family business, your, your grandmother's been doing it for 30 plus years now. And, um, one thing that was going on when I was stopping through is you guys are building a house right next to the existing house on the property for your, your aunt. Yep. Yep. My aunt Barb, I call her my aunt Barbie sometimes call it. We're building Barbie's house over there. Um, but yep, she um, she is she she is in great health, but she has had an illness kind of come up. And as she gets a little older, we, the, my grandparents want her to be closer to them. That way they can just keep a close eye on her. And things just so happen to work out where we are blessed enough to be able to build our own house for her. So we had started construction about five months ago now, which is crazy to say out loud that it's only been five months and we have gotten so much of it done. I mean, we have done every part of it ourselves except for the concrete coming in, but I, did, I didn't want to pour a whole slab of concrete by hand and then the, the roof being put on, but we have, we started you know, framing it and getting it all together, but it's been a real great learning process. And to see how happy my aunt Barb is and to know that how happy she's going to be whenever she does get it, whenever we get it done, she moves in there. I mean, it's going to be, I'm so excited for it. The the whole process has been amazing so far. Yeah, I was, I was impressed. I mean, we went out, we, we built this house. We did about 70% of it ourselves, but we, we even like paid the rough, we did some of the concrete ourselves. Um, when I visited, you guys had the rough up, which is the sticks. It's all the wood, and you guys were putting in the plumbing and electrical. And oh, yeah. uh, I mean, I remember having so much fun doing that with this house. Um, yeah, learning all that goes into a building house or into building a house is just invaluable. Um, such a such a young age, right? You're how old? I'm 21. I had to think about that. Oh, God. <laughs> Man, I thought you were like 22, 23, but no, yeah, you'll be able to say that you pretty much helped build a house from from that age and that that those skills can transfer into anything, right? You guys are always putting work in on that property. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, if things go right, weren't you talking about putting a house on that property at some point? Yep, I hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, in about a year, I'll or at the end of this year, 2024, I'm gonna have my house started. I'm gonna start at least on the foundation. I um, you know, with all the skills I'm learning and everything we're doing up here, I'm thankful enough to be able to hopefully build my own place up here. And you know, it, there's a lot that goes into it but I feel like I'm very dedicated to learn it. And this is stuff that I could stick with me for the rest of my life. You know, I could know how to build and not only building a house, but we're also, I'm redoing fences and, you know, the barn and, you know, I'm learning so much information that I never thought I would have the opportunity to learn. And I mean, it has been amazing. And I mean, the house, uh, for instance, I mean, to be able to, say that I helped build a house or even say that I, I made my own house is going to be such a privilege. I mean, I'm so excited to have these houses finished and be able to say, I, I helped with that. You know, that's, I think that's a big thing. I mean, how, how, do, how do you feel after having your house built? I mean, that's going to be like, I did that right there. Like that, that was me. Like we did it. Yeah. I, I, I do feel very proud of that. It was, it was probably the hardest thing that we've ever done. Um, we had a, we had a, you know, Chelsea was pregnant during half of it and then had the, the baby. Yeah. So like she's doing all the planning, you know, uh, she was our, our general contractor. She's doing all the planning. She's telling me, 
hey, when this is done, this is what we're doing next. And then every single day, I'm just like a grunt working on whatever we're doing at the time and making trips to Home Depot to try to get the materials for the next thing. And yeah. it was hard. And be like, feel fortunate that you live so close to that house build because that is huge. We were we were living like 45 minutes away oh. with a baby, living out of suitcases. And um, I mean, we slept in this house w towards the end, which is like squatting. Uh, but <laughs> we were also living at her parents, which live like 10 minutes away. And we would just work, okay. you know, work our full time job, take care of our kid work until the sun went down and then some and then repeat it all over again uh my hygiene was atrocious during that that whole build process but well yeah. i mean you put everything on hold and i mean that is the top priority and you know everything else has to get done still but the house has to get yep. i mean it's still top priority and you know not I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it, it's a crazy process. It really is. But I mean, yeah, you're, you're kind of like, I don't even know what a good analogy is like, Hey, I'm, I'm driving from, I'm driving down to Georgia from Michigan. It's like, I dedicated 12 hours to do that. I'm like literally dedicating a year of my life and I can't stop. Right. I, I can't stop or I have this just money pit on the ground. I have to just keep working through it. And there is no turning back. I mean, it's you can't stressful. Back halfway through, you can't, right. especially if you're doing it all of it yourself, it, it makes you feel that much better. But there's a lot more. I mean, there's stuff that goes into building a house that I don't think the average person would ever think of. They're like, that, you know, there's so much of it. I just, I mean, it's, it's awesome that y'all built y'all's house, really. I mean, that, that's a real dream of mine. I'm hoping I can be there with you one day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll, if you're, you stick to your path, you're going to be building your house before us with more experience than us. Um, there was something you said that I wanted to, I wanted to branch off on and I don't remember what it was. Uh, nope. It, it, it lost it. When, well, when you do it, though, you're going to the amount of decisions you have to make is just like unbearable. At least this time, your your Aunt Barb is making a lot of the decorative decisions. But the amount of time we spent looking at like ceiling fans and countertops oh, and stuff. For me personally, I am going to put all the money I have into the foundation, just the house, the inside of the house. I'm going to have some box fans i mean i'm gonna have the bare the light fixtures i'm gonna have just porcelain light fixtures that you just i don't i don't i'm not gonna have anything fancy i'm not you know you're still gonna walk through home depot or whatever your hardware store is and look at well this one's the same price as that one and then you're gonna have a mental breakdown of of which one you want to <laughs> pick that's what it was that's what i was gonna say uh dedicating ourselves for this year to work on this house i mean we freaking we shared we juggled mental breakdowns i had a mental breakdown and she supported me she had a mental breakdown i supported her oh my god it, it was it was nuts man um what's been your favorite part of it so far my favorite part of it i would say seeing the progress has been my well, no, I guess that's being real broad. Well, you're just to the framing. Like, are you enjoying doing the plumbing and the electrical, or was the framing your favorite part? The framing we did not do, and it was wild. We like disappeared for a week, and then we came back, and our house was up. Just like, Fair. what the heck? And it probably took you several months to do all that because it was just you know three or four of you. Well, the beginning of it, the concrete, the foundation, miserable. I mean, just miserable. It was the heat of summer where we got this. First of all, I think like we had like a mixer and it's violently shaking. You have to like hold it. One person's pouring and you Are pour you it. You mixed it all yourself? We mixed almost all of it ourselves except for like the big slab in the front. So oh for God. hours, hours, right? And I guess, I guess this is my worst part and I'll tell you my favorite. But the worst part was, you know, we had to get the ground perfectly level. Yep. I'm out there double for way too long trying to make it perfect and then you get all the boxes up and then 
that that's a process and then the, the concrete right we had the mixer you put it put the bag in the mixer add water pour the mixer or pour the concrete from the mixer into a bucket and then i had to lift the bucket up because the thing that wasn't tall enough to just or it wasn't short enough to just pour it into so i had to manually like lift the bag and then all the off oh my off. god i'm you know? like we had concrete trucks and that was oh my god wow yeah. i didn't no. realize you did that by hand yeah. yeah not all of it though i won't take credit for all of it but most of those oh so painful but my favorite part was definitely the framing the framing yeah. was amazing because once everything was level with the world and we got you know all the i should remember the names of them the all all the boards that go up and then seeing right. it each day it moves so fast yeah like to see the progress compared to now, which is like we just worked on it for like four or five hours today and just did the most tedious things to it to just add here and there to make it just sound and perfect. But if you know my man comes or anyone comes outside and like, hey, what did y'all do today? It looks like y'all did nothing. <laughs> right. It looks like we did nothing, but so much went into it and it's gonna pay off all at the end. And I guess that's been another great thing is seeing in the beginning, I, I would be told things like, hey, we need to do this, we need to do that. And I'd be asking, why, 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 why are we doing this? I don't understand. But then eventually, if you just listen, just keep going with it, all of it, it all pieces together. There's a reason why you did this five steps ahead whenever you did this and whenever you did that. It, it, it Just seeing it all pieced together has been so fun to watch. And there has been some miserable parts, but most of it has been. <laughs> amazing so much That's i'm just great. hoping that it carries on to building my house i hope i enjoy as much as i am now <laughs> you're yeah you're again you're gonna learn so much and i, I, I like that you're actually having fun with it because i definitely wasn't at points in time I, I think my worst time was uh we were trying to pass ex final electrical inspection and so we're going around the house like putting outlets in and uh, putting lights inside and outside, you know, fans and everything. And the amount of times I had to take Home Depot is like 30 minutes away. The amount of times I had to drive to Home Depot to get a specific length screw so that I could attach an outlet was terrible, right? You, you could, like you said, you could spend a whole couple hours and put all these outlet boxes in, make all this progress. But if you're wasting all your time to buy one screw, it's it's brutal and it just sucks everything you have out of yourself. And then to be set back, like when you're like, I could be doing this, that, you yeah. know, like looking at it, you could it would look like you did so much more work and maybe you'd only work for five minutes, but going to Home Depot and getting all the supplies and getting everything you need, it just, it, it just something about it just makes <laughs> you roll roll over and cry or something <laughs> you'll probably have some uh some tears when you build your house i'm just uh gonna be honest with you i'm just hoping and tell me if i'm wrong but it's gonna feel so worth it at the end when it's all done and you can look back that that's been kind of what i've been doing with aunt barb's house and everything i've been doing is the end goal is going to be so worth it just wait it's going to be it hope Take notes though, like like I want you to see that house finished and then reflect on what you and your grandpa could have done better so you can take that on to your next house. Because we're not building another house and there's already things I know that I would change. But, uh, you know, by and large, we nailed it pretty good. I'll say Ch Chelsea nailed it pretty good because I was just <laughs> I was just doing the work. She was designing and everything. Well, that that's the That's the bulk of it is building it. I mean, that's yeah it's a lot it's fun though that's great i mean i don't know is there anything else you want to talk through uh otherwise i feel like we touched everything that we wanted to go through and uh you know ho hopefully the listeners don't think that some of these stories are too gory but it's just the reality of being on a farm and that's exactly what i wanted to get into with us there's one story that we can wrap up with now this is a little bit on the darker side but i've never heard of this happening ever before my grandparents, they've only ever heard of it happening like one time before. We had 
right? Rest in peace. I know this is a little bit dark again, but rest in peace. We have um, Betsy the Pony. No, sorry, not Betsy. That's the mother. Molly. Molly the Pony. She was two years old. And we had Tate, Tater Tot the Donkey. Great donkey. Out in the pasture one night, awful storm came through. I mean, wicked storm. We were hearing the lightning. The whole room would flash up. Crazy. I don't even think we noticed until I think it was a day later because um, the storm was bad. We went through and we checked up on all the animals like normal, but I didn't see these two. And I figured, oh, they're just off somewhere. Well, they got struck by lightning and they oh, were standing underneath the tree. I mean, our best animals. I mean, really, our best donkey and cow or donkey and horse just dropped dead by lightning. I mean, that's crazy to me. I mean, the fact that two animals, same, they were standing like right next to each other, just dropped dead. I just, I just felt the need to share that with you. It was craziness. I know it was a little dark, but yeah. You know. And I'm here. I'm just here awkwardly smiling because that's what I do <laughs> when uh when I uh, hear bad news. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. There, there's a lot of craziness on the farm, um, but I. I greatly appreciate you having me on this podcast. I I hope everything goes well. A little a little shameless plug, the little red Yeah, yeah. Ball. Give any shout outs you want and uh, plug, your, plug your plug your business, plug your page. Yep, Little Red Barn, uh, mobile petting farm. If you look that up online, we have a website. It'll show you our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. Go check everything out. We post new YouTube's uh, YouTube videos once a week. Got to keep up with the little red barn. Number one, number one animal channel out here. We'll, uh, we'll put some of those links in the show notes. And, uh, you know, when we make this post, you'll get to see a lot of the cute animals and the, the, the happier side of living on a farm. Oh yeah. Um, yep. A lot more happy stuff that happens. We just touched on some of the bad today. <laughs> maybe, tough maybe. Times make high quality fun. Tough times make good stories. Well, thank you so much, Nathan. This was super fun. I hope you got a, got a kick out of it. And I look forward to sharing this with everyone. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And I hope you can edit around me being bad at podcasting. I'm not editing anything. Thank you for listening to the High Quality Fun Podcast. If you guys enjoyed this show, please give us a follow. And if you have a good story or just want to say hi, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram or YouTube. Thanks for listening.